We've got a very special episode for you this week uh, about a Polish legend, the Pope, Pope John Paul II. Perhaps you've heard of him? Yes. Um, Mike, would you care to give us his, his uh, given Polish name? Uh, Karol Wojtyła. No. I forgot his middle name right now. Beautifully pronounced, Mike. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and the reason we're so excited about this is I actually, well, I'm excited about it because I actually got to Poland in 2005 for the very first time. It was July. Uh, so the Pope died on uh, April 1st. Uh, but the, the city was still in mourning. You know, there was still all these amazing candle tributes. And, you know, even though it was a staunch in the wool, raised a Catholic, you know, went to Catholic school, all of that stuff, not particularly religious. So uh, I hadn't paid the Pope's uh, debt, the kind of attention that maybe a Polish person have. And I was astonished by the outpouring grief. I don't know if you guys were here that year, but you could, there was a, a row of... Um, buildings, you know, the 12-story apartment blocks, and uh, each night they'd kind of synchronise the, the the lights in the windows to spell out his name. It was amazing. Oh, right. Yeah, no, little things like that, and the amazing amount of candles on the planty, and, you know, got to me straight away, you know, what this guy meant to, to Poland. So I've always been fascinated by him. Um, and I suppose I always saw him as the Pope growing up. All right, of course. But he had a fascinating life. You know, we're going to go through some of this stuff. It's going to be difficult because he lived a, a long life, um, a long, interesting life, and a lot of things happened. Everything from, what would you say, Mike, uh, from at the time of his death, possibly controversial even, uh, you know, covering up uh, certain things in the church all the way to his uh, noble and historic role, uh, you know, in uh, ending communism in Eastern Europe. So, but let's start, let's go right back to the start, Mikey. Give us a little bit of his uh, early life to set us up. Well, he was born and raised in Wadowice. His birthday, if I remember correctly, was May 18th, 1920. So he was, uh, it would be a hundred, no, a hundred years come this year. So it's going to be a major, I'm pretty sure, celebration here in Poland. Uh, his mother died when he was nine years old. He had an older sister who died before he was born. He had an older brother who he was apparently very close with, who was, I think, like about Right, 13 years yeah, old. 13 yeah. years his senior, who was also a doctor who, who died from scarlet fever from treating patients. Uh, so, you know, he had a lot of close people that died relatively quickly in his life. Uh, Pretty grim upbringing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but there's also a lot of things they talk about his uh, when he was being raised as a child. There's already these, these signs of what kind of person he would become. First of all, he was, he was very athletic. He played on his, you know, his local soccer team, football team. Mm -hmm. He's a goalkeeper, goal, right? Goalkeeper. Uh, and also he mentioned this a lot in uh, many interviews and speeches he gave about the fact that the community he lived in, Vadavica, was very diverse. There was a large Jewish population. And the main mm -hmm. teams that uh, were made there were usually the Catholic school or kids playing with the Jewish kids. And he often was playing goalie on the Jewish team. And, he, you know, there was always a lot of talk about, you know, these were like friends and family and colleagues. This was part of the community. There's also talk about the fact that his first, like, say, romantic interest as a teenager was also a, a Jewish girl. I just remember this, like, description of her hair being, like, you know, dark and like a raven or something like that. But, you know, this is also brought up a lot when people go back to his, like, early childhood and what kind of person he was. Uh, you know, th then they left Vadovice. He went to study in uh, in Krakow with his father, and then and he, at that time it was also shown that he was had a lot of skills for not only the arts, theater, and writing and poetry, but for language uh, in general. Uh, I was just stopping there. A lot of skills. The guy was a, a genius. I mean, he spoke twelve languages. One of them that I didn't even know. I didn't I'd never even seen this word before. What, what, what's this language he spoke? You mean Josh? Esperanto. Esperanto, yeah. great name. Like yeah. sounds like a, a Chevrolet pickup from the seventies well, or something. We should probably we should probably do a like special about Esperanto all on its own. But I mean, interestingly, Esperanto was an invented language. Uh, the idea being that the gr grammar would be as regular and kind of like, you know, easy to deal with as possible and such that it could possibly become a world language that everyone could speak very easily. And the guy who invented it, I think his name was Zaman, Zamanhof or something. He was actually Polish, but he was a smart dude and he realized that Polish was never going to catch on as the basis for an international easy to learn language. So he in instead based it upon more or less Spanish. Very interesting. Uh, let me just read this list. Polish, obviously. Latin, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, French, English, German, Ukrainian, Serbo-Croatian, Slovak. Slovak. He speaks very good English, uh, his speeches. You know, I mean, uh, slowly but clearly, I would say, uh, you know, uses a uh, nice vocabulary. Of course, he speaks good English. He's a 12-language genius. Uh, but yeah, continue, Michael. Um, so he's at Jagiellonian at this stage. Jagiellonian, yeah? yes. But then, you know, uh, Germany invades World War II to begin. Bastards. Uh, yeah, they always seem to get in the way of everything. 
and they shut down the universities and he has to go work. He works, there's a few jobs. One, I think, is like a messenger for a restaurant or That's something correct, like that. That's correct, yes. Yeah. Uh, then there's hard labor involved when he's in working. In the limestone quarry. Yeah, in a quarry. Real, real hard labor. This is something now that he refers back to constantly in his later life. You know, he never forgot that experience of being a, a worker. Like, it was hard work. And this is, you know, a few years of hard work during Nazi German occupation. So, you know, this, uh, you know, it's not the problem that you're going to get fired, but, you know, you're going to get fired at if something goes wrong. Uh, but the fact that he had this employment also meant that he wasn't deported to Germany because Germany also uh, deported a lot of people from occupied countries to their own country to work as slave or forced labor during World War II. It should also be mentioned that at this time his father passed away, so at the age of about 20... And we should also say he seems to get hit by a lot of vehicles in this period yeah, of his he, life. He's, he, he's, he seems to be a little absent-minded in the, uh, in the street department. Uh, he gets hit by... Let's go through this. He gets hit by two trucks uh, and a tram. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, on three separate occasions. Three separate yeah. occasions. <laughs> yeah, uh, they didn't have that whole thing with the pedestrian crossings in those days, I guess. It's not. And you thought Germans were all about, you know, order in the streets and stuff like that, but no. Drive no. like lunatics. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he described the Nazi uh, regime as bestiality, as he experienced it. You know, uh, I think that would have been a very formative uh, time in his life. I think that'd be fair to say, Mike. Uh, no, of course. And he joins the priesthood just just after, right? During actually During, the sorry. occupation, he you know he starts his spirituality trying to really come up, to, and he f actually joins the seminar and be, to 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 study to become a priest in secret because this was obviously you know closed off at that time. Um, and then the occupant, and this is actually, he was also hit, that was the second time when he was hit by a truck, third time tr hit by a vehicle. Uh, but the G German soldiers actually picked him up out of the street and took him to hospital and he survived it. And he realized, he always stated that he took this as a sign to mean that, you know, God saved him for a reason, you know, Mary go saved him for a reason. Uh, go practice for the assassination attempts later. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which, uh, he took a brutal towel on and we'll get to that as well. Like, uh, extraordinary stuff. Uh, but, you know, let's move on now. Uh, let's jump forward a little bit to when he uh, kind of gets his first big job, Mikey, in, uh, in Krakow. As the, uh, he's like the archbishop, right? Well, he, he was in like the lower positions before that in, in, in Krakow, but then he also becomes bishop of Krakow or mm -hmm. uh, as the youngest man ever uh, I think uh, in Poland, I think, at the age of 39, 8, something like that. So he's like class at saying mass, like on top of everything else, like he bangs out a great mass. Like, oh, you know? well, that's actually one thing uh, at this time when he became... Uh, that was his ceremony skills. Like He you know? was noted for doing uh, pres uh, g giving mass uh, in Nova Huta, where there was no church at the time, you know, so this symbol of communism, mm -hmm. the model town built around the workers, but there was no church there, which people would always uh, complain about. So what he would do, he gave Christmas mass there, you know, on midnight mass every year, starting from the late 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, until they built the church. Until they built the church. You know, this was a huge, uh, you know, it really was despite the uh, the Catholic, I mean, the communist regime at the time that, you know, they like, oh, you know, we're going to be secular atheists, good communists, good workers. And like, no, the people want this. And they demanded it and it happened. It was like one of the first times that, you know, they were actually able to win against the regime then. He developed a theological approach called, uh, you know, of course I'm reading this, uh, phenomenological uh, Thomism. Thomism. Thomism, uh, yeah, Thomism. yeah. St. Thomas Aquinas. Yes, of course, yes. Um, uh, the combined traditional Catholic uh, Thomism with the idea of personalism, a ph philosophical approach deriving from phenomenology, uh, which was popular among uh, Catholic intellectuals in crack of discuss. Well, it's derived. Okay, I know a little bit about this. I'm good, I, and I, I the emphasis is on the word little because I'm sure there's some smart ass out there who will just jump down my neck on otherwise. But the basis of St. Thomas Aquinas' teachings on 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 the on the mystery of God and the and and the interpretation of the scriptures and uh, the resurrection and so forth. Um, a lot of it was based on his understanding of Aristotelian philosophy, and um, there's. This it's great. I think it's possibly one of the most intellectually interesting and beautiful things about the, 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 the tradition of the Catholic Church is this marriage of the, the almost the foundation of Greek philosophy from Aristotle and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' interpretations of the teachings uh, from the Bible, in particular the teachings of Christ and via the uh, letters of St. Paul. And so it's 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 a reasonable kind of um, 
kind of, shall we say, suggestion that kind of uh, John Paul II was one of the big wheels in terms of kind of developing this whole notion of a kind of an intellectual philosophical strand of Catholicism, which I think tends to get overlooked, you know, <clears throat> compared to so much of the other things. that It's a good time to pause, though, and kind of get a handle on where he stands, because within the Catholic Church, of course, like uh, within any uh, organisation, there's different ideological kind of positions, you know, you know, wings, uh, so to speak. So how would you describe, Mikey, his uh, his various stances and what they added up to? Uh, he's very much a traditionalist in some sense, but not so much in other senses, would you? Uh, he was a... He was say I wouldn't want to use the progressive, but he was definitely the kind of person who wanted to step away from the traditions that separated the priesthood and the hierarchy from the people. So he was definitely a lot more simple in, when it came to procedures and the pomp and circumstance of being a pope. Mm -hmm. He spoke to people directly. Uh, when he was appointed pope, he, you know, the whole scenario where the cardinals bow before him and kiss the ring, he actually stopped the first cardinal from bowing and hugged him instead. So in that sense, he was an anti-traditionalist, but he was known for being very conservative when it came to other things that, you know, during his pontificacy were changing. So issues of, of abortion, sexuality, contraception, uh, contraception, women in the priesthood. He was quite conservative when it came to those things. And the uh, celibacy vow as well. He, he was very much a traditionalist uh, about that. Although uh, I did read that he, he allowed some married priests who'd converted to Catholicism in some small cases, uh, you know, become Catholic priests with wives, which is interesting. Uh, so, uh, one, I mean, we're going to get to, I suppose it's good enough time to, as any to talk about, we're jumping out of the chronology a bit, but one of the things that really strikes me, uh, you've already touched on it with his, his, um, with Judaism is also with the Muslim faith, you know, he was very much uh, an outreach program. That must have been a big part of his, uh, the personalism philosophy, uh, you know, that he espoused, um, you know, didn't he like uh, kiss the Quran, cause a bit of a storm in, in Syria once, uh, you know, and, the, you know, most of the, the senior rabbis felt he was uh, the best Pope ever in terms of outreach towards Judaism. And the list goes on, wouldn't you say, Mike? He was the first one at the Western Wall. Yep. He was the first one to uh, take part in uh, prayers in in a uh, in a mosque, I think in Damascus. I think that's actually the that's right. Yeah. Uh, when uh, he did kiss the Quran, he was very uh, adamant about bringing the faith to get faiths together. So Judaism, uh, Islam, Orthodox Christianity. He wanted them to find their common ground and bring about you know a peace and understanding as much as possible. I mean, this really wasn't without controversy, actually, and the fact that it was in Syria, where the traditionally, if if I get this right, the main or the dominant strand of Christianity in Syria is Coptic mm -hmm. rather than Roman Catholic. And uh, <clears throat> there, there, there's kind of elements of, of you know, the, the, if you like, the earliest schism in the church, which was the kind of, you know, the separation of the Orthodox Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Um, which I think is like something like the 6th or 7th century or something like that, but I'm happily <laughs> likely to be proven wrong. But, uh, and, uh, you know, and this schism exists to this day. And, of course, there are, you know, there, 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 is, a, there is an Orthodox Pope uh, who mm -hmm. is sort of grudgingly recognised by the Vatican. And uh, similarly, the Orthodox Pope kind of sort of says, yeah, OK, there's a guy in Rome. And how long? He's a Pope. He's not the Pope, you know. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I guess I, yeah. I'm only messing, I'm only messing, I'm only messing. Yeah, yeah. Who is the, uh, who is the Eastern Pope at the moment? I knew you were going to ask me this, but I didn't know it quick enough to. Yeah, because nobody has a Scooby, man. Yeah, Nobody's yeah. ever well, heard of it. They've got the Coptic and you also have the Greek <laughs> Orthodox. Yeah. yeah. And then there's the yeah, one it's with. A, it's a fair Coptic, I think. Uh, <laughs> for once I like it. Okay. Now, Mike, you, I, I very much, we jumped ahead there because what was trying to do there is, uh, I think it's important to realize before he comes Pope, who he is, what he about and what he represents to me he's a kind of almost a centrist when you add it up uh, in terms of you know a traditionalist that the traditionalists now won't break on the important doctrinal positions that they hold there but also can have this new era of outreach almost um celebrity one might say he brings to the office he brings a glamour he brings a, a vigor to it you know the amount of travel he takes on he changes the role completely he's the first one to you know, uh, you know, he preaches in a Protestant church in England, all these different things, you know, the list goes on and on and on. But how does he become Pope? This is a really interesting story because there hasn't been a non-Italian Pope at this stage for over 500 years. So take us into the uh, white smoky region of the College of Cardinals. Yeah, what the were they smoking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you, uh, do you know the story, Mike, of how uh, he became Pope? 
Uh, well, I think we need to go back to the kind of person he was. And I, I think Josh wants to interject at this moment because he seemed to be kind of... Oh, uh, just, to, just to remind everybody who had kind of like forgotten like I had that the current uh, Coptic Pope is, of course, Tawadros II. Who has held that? Who was the 118, 118th uh, Coptic Pope, and he's been in office since November the eighteenth, two thousand and twelve. Okay, yeah, no. I hope you all remember that next time you're on Jeopardy. Yeah. Uh, can't see him drawing five million in Manila. Pull it that way. No, can't see <laughs> not, not so much of a thriller. Yeah. <laughs> no. So Carol Vaitua still as a priest, as you know, uh, in. In, in Krakow, really uh, gathered his following around him. He started this group of young people uh, that they would travel, you know, together, kayaking, skiing. And you have to remember, this is happening at the beginning of the communist regime in Poland when priests weren't allowed to, outside of church, hang out with young people. You know, he was a young person himself that time. So they started this kind of like deal or this conspiracy when he wouldn't dress as a priest when they were traveling together and you would have the uh, you know the people with him refer to him as Vujek uncle mm -hmm. and this is a name that stuck with him until the very end uh Vujek our uncle uh, and he would travel with young people into the mountains he loved hiking all these sports activities and meeting with students and the youth for the next couple of uh, decades he, f he was very close to the populace in that sense and People kind of liked, you know, the fact that they were like both both sides, like him and the people he was with, always like trying to get away from the communist regime. That kind of brought them even closer together. He built this relationship with with his flock uh, in a way that very few priests can nowadays. And this, and he got lucky. There was two Italian uh, oh, yeah, two contenders, Siri and Benelli, right? And they just couldn't split them, right? So eventually, that's the way it works. You know, that's you just got to choose, also, choose someone new. He had made friends on certain tr on And he trips was well the placed then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, lots of the uh, cardinals in America yeah, liked him John as well. John Kroll, uh, the American guy who led the moderates, uh, rode in behind him then when they couldn't split them up. So like, oh, you can't them. decide on these two guys? Well, how about this guy over here? And But the thing is, once they decide on him, it was the backing for him was very strong. It's like a, a, a kind of everybody realized, no, this is actually a good idea. And he went straight out and started bench pressing priests and running up mountains <laughs> and, you know, adding a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of vigor to the office, wouldn't you say? I mean, he hits the ground running, bang, he's off. I think he was in Ireland in 79. Uh, you know, there wasn't a person on the street. Was over was a million a, people. Same well, he was a, relatively young also. And I mean, yeah, not only the youngest was, since uh, 1850 uh, or something like that. Not, like, a, not only was he relatively young, but I mean, he was physically vigorous. I mean, you know, uh, he... He had kind of, shall we say, kind of physical, pre you know, he wasn't the, if, if all you know is the, 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 the stooped kind of 80 year old Pope from, you know, his last years. But, you know, when he first kind of took over, he was. Um, I mean, he's still 58. I doubt he was playing a goal still. Like, but, you yeah, know, he's he ca more than capable hey, of a lot. Nothing wrong with 58. Yeah, no, never said, never said there was. No, you're looking, you're looking in great shape. <laughs> We'll make yeah. a pop out of you yet. Josh, <laughs> Josh, still bringing vigor to the crack cast studio. <laughs> yeah. So let's get serious again. Uh, you know, the guy has a, a visceral hatred of totalitarian regimes, having lived under one himself. And it's very... Two, actually. Yeah, two, excuse me. And it's very important to him what's happening back in his homeland. He is a political, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the greatest sense of the word. So I'd like to, to, to give our listeners a bit of context about who he was at this time to the Polish people, politically, not just religiously. To, when he came to Poland, at, came back to Poland as Pope, you know, he had left to go take part in as a cardinal to to vote in who will be the new popes. And, you know, and he will come right back. Actually, he didn't come back. That was, for, sorry to interrupt, mate, but that was presumably a real big deal for Polish Catholics, even in itself. That, that you know, one of their own was like, you know, in there with the College of Cardinals in the Vatican, kind of like already a kind of... And especially, he, he was already popular back then, so yeah. it was, people spoke about it, but... He, and, you know, instead of coming back a few weeks later, he didn't come back until several months later. You know, there, there was a joke about it. It's like, sorry for taking so long. Uh, and he comes back as Pope. And, you know, all the, the nation, the country is in love with him for there is just no way to describe or to pass on the influence, the impact he had. Poles saw somebody, you know, th their faith uh, was something that really united them against the communist regime because the communist regime was an atheist agnostic institution which 
try to force in secularism to people who weren't interested in uh, that uh, that kind of those kind of lack of beliefs. So their faith really held them together. And the fact that one of their own had become the head of the church was just unfathomable. Nobody saw this coming. Uh, and it really unified and made, made people feel more uh, enabled to stand the adversity that the, uh, the Communist Party had brought into them. So when he came here, the Communist Party was worried, you know, will he get the people riled up? Will there be riots in the streets? What will happen? And they were also thinking like, well, maybe we could control and make him stick by our rules because he's, you know, he's also law abiding. And then people will follow his example. And, but he was, the uh, as Pope was very skilled at kind of navigating between this mm-hmm. by inspiring the people but not being this uh, a puppet of the state as well you know this kind of like soft power i guess you could talk about it uh just one of f- first like mass sermons where you know gave to more than a, m- a million people uh he do you think his tremendous command of languages because i've heard him speak in a lot of these speeches you know you can you can listen to them still and and agree uh he could tread that line i would say it nearly like he knew how how to code a message in an unoffensive way where the regime couldn't say he was blatantly calling them out. But at the same time, he wasn't saying to the people, just accept this, not not by any stretch of the imagination. But he he did it without being overt. Is exactly. It? There's one famous statement, which I guess we translate like, let the Holy Spirit, you know, come into the land, this land. And he and he says it in a way where you know you can interpret just meaning you know generally you know mm-hmm. feel the love of God come into you and give it you strength. But I'm specifically talking to you here right now, Polish people in Poland, do something about yeah. this. You know, this is the kind of double. Uh, and I'm actually I'm going to just like very quickly interject something, but I mean it's probably like little known now, but actually. Um, <clears throat> You weren't allowed to say, you know, the Bible was, if not exactly a banned book, you certainly couldn't sell the Bible in um, in shops during the during the, the communist times. The, 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 yeah. the, there were stories about people smuggling Bibles into Poland and other kind of, you know, of the of the sort of Soviet satellites during that that kind of era. Funny they don't do what the Chinese do now is make a, a government approved version of the Bible. <laughs> yes, this is something that I've, I've questioned the Catholic Church a lot right now about. Just on a side note, here is how they kind of. But it's important yeah. to know as well, of course, Soviet communism, like, you know, was different uh, in Russia than, uh, than it certainly was here. And, you know, they were they were afraid to ever crush the, the, the Catholic Church. The, you know, the Catholic Church was always a bulwark against communism. It was the reason communism wasn't totally implemented properly in Soviet eyes, really, wasn't it? I mean, you know, it was one thing they had to very much compromise with the... I mean, it wasn't just the... And the other satellite says that wasn't was the case. just the faith of the people here was so strong yeah. that, you know, they didn't subscribe to all these other like philosophical f- uh, features of Marxism and communism. It's like, yeah, we could talk about the economics there, but we're not bringing in these philosophies. They're not going to mm-hmm. replace our traditions and our, uh, uh, and our uh, beliefs, you know, and, and one of the things about cultural Marxism is, is, is always been to try to push that out. So anyway, the year after he goes, uh, Solidarity uh, in 1980, you know, is then, you know, g- goes on to win, um, you know, some huge uh, concessions from the government. The government then cracks down with martial law all the way along. The Pope, he's not screaming from the rooftops, but he's supporting, you know, he's going to Washington, you know, he's making sure everyone's back is stiff. You know, uh, he's, 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 he's quietly working in Poland's corner all the time, right? Oh, this is true. And there's a lot of people uh, make the argument that if it wasn't for him, then communism in Poland and in Eastern Europe might not have fallen for years longer, if, if, if at all. Who knows what it would have changed into, like some kind of uh, Belarusian or you know a Russian-style state now in Poland and in Ukraine and in East Germany. Uh, he gave people here hope and something to work against uh, and to work together to a degree that, you know, we talk about Wałęsa, uh, Lech Wałęska starting uh, in solidarity. That wouldn't have happened without uh, Pope John Paul II inspiring an entire nation to come together. There's a good quote from um, from a historian, John Lewis Gaddis. Uh, when John Paul II kissed the ground of the Warsaw Airport, he began the process by which communism, Poland, and ultimately elsewhere in Europe would come to an end. You know... Uh, Maybe it's a simplification, but, you know, there's no doubt he was the, the great symbol of the struggle, really, for people. And you can't understate how important he is then, 
he makes him not just this giant religious figure. Like Josh said, imagine just the thrill of the first non-Italian Pope in 500 years yeah, being yeah. Polish. Then it's the fact that, uh, you know, he's a legend of the struggle too. Like he takes on this almost mythical status in Polish society. And that's uh, what I found a bit hard to understand when I, when, when I first got here. But would you like to uh, to cover some of his uh, other innovations as Pope? What do you think of World Youth Day? You know, a bunch of religious people pretending they're at a festival. No beer anywhere. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Controversial. He started, uh, what was it, like in 83 or 85, something like that. Uh, the first youth world, uh, world Youth Day. And this is for those who don't know what it is, this is the Woodstock for religious people. They show up in tie dye t shirts, but there's no drugs and there's no drink and uh, there's no smoke. It's just like. Yeah, Happy they're just vibes. kind of like, yeah, smiling a lot and bursting into song at this Very neat backpacks. But yeah. good vibes, man. We had one here in Krakow, right? You remember that? A couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As far as I know, everyone local vacated the city. Kind of. oh, the town no, the went dry. Didn't it? The town went dry. Do you remember? We went I to don't know. I wasn't here. I was I in England. It went like, dry. <laughs> It I went dry for the Pope's B- Benedict's visit. Oh, Sorry, yeah, oh, no, that, that was that was that was that was truly. I won't disastrous. name the local pub, but we put uh, we put uh, black bags on the window and turned it into a speakeasy. Pretend it was someone's uh, birthday party until uh, the cops just, shut us down. I had a friend of mine just she just smuggled pub, in a, a, remember, a bottle of champagne, and we had a great night anyway. Pope and her Pope, there was some pop in here. Anyway. Champagne corks. Anyway, so World <laughs> Youth Days, uh, you know, we presided over nine of them. Uh, Rome got to host twice, Buenos Aires, Santiago de Compostela, Chestahova, Denver, Manila, the Trilla in Manila, as Josh said, Paris, Toronto. This is something I keep skirting around. I'm just going to say it. He was good at PR. He knew how to build the brand of the papacy up. Would, would that be fair to say? I mean, it seems to be a lot. Of, like, I don't remember the Pope Mobile really being a thing, you know. Uh, well, then again, I wouldn't have been, <laughs> wouldn't have been alive before he was a Pope, but, you know. Did he, uh, Josh, <laughs> Josh, you're old enough to remember his predecessor. Uh, did he bring a bit of flair to the office? Well, I mean, well, his immediate predecessor was John Paul I, who, of course, didn't last very long at all. I think barely a month. Um, but prior to him was Pope Paul VI, who held office from 1963 until 1978. And um, he was very much the Pope who kind of was picking up the pieces uh, after, uh, you know, getting things back on track after the fallout uh, and the various you know, bad stuff that was flying around in terms of, you know, to what extent the Roman Catholic Church kind of um, aided and abetted the kind of Nazis in the Holocaust and stuff, which is still a kind of touchy subject to these days. Anyway, we're getting a little off track here, so... um, um Anyway, um, let's give you a few more highlights and then Mikey can kind of uh, do a pick and mix of which one he wants to talk about next. Uh, Opposed uh, apartheid in South Africa, outspoken opponent of that, uh, outspoken opponent of the capital punishment laws uh, around the world. Very much a vocal proponent of joining the EU. Um, You know, made some important clarifications about how he respected uh, the science of evolution. Uh, You know, again, Josh was saying this earlier, touching on this, that a lot of people don't appreciate that the Catholic Church does have a history of slowly, you know, acknowledging things, you know, and blending them into their theology uh, in what they would consider the correct Mm. and uh, formal manner. Actually, I'm sorry, because I didn't intend to interrupt, but I think I, you know, it needs to be kind of, you know, in fact, the the real kind of push for for the theory of evolution to be kind of like generally accepted not just within the church but actually in the wider world was was an, was an undertaking by a roman catholic monk um you know in the in the sort of uh, what i think the like the 1930s or whatever and um you know wrote a very very kind of like elegant kind of like apologia for you know the the the, the sense of the development of evolution and how it kind of works perfectly scientifically whilst not in any way disagreeing with the basic idea that the origin of life lies in the hands of God. And a lot of people don't realize that, yes, uh, the Catholic Church of the Church in general is like talk about being anti-science, but over the last few hundred years, it's often been priests that have been, you know, and monks with, you know, a lot of free time to experiment that have really started off the scientific uh, process. Hell, when we're talking, hell, I don't know if I should be using that. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, we're Hades. Talking, <laughs> we're talking about genetics here or evolution. You know, when we're talking about Mendel there, who he was, a, you know, a, a man of the faith who, who sat around a lot, with a lot of free time to play around with pea plants. Uh, so a lot of theology, not just theology, but the sciences were... Uh, sped up by uh, men of faith over generations. It's 
once in a while there were issues that conflicted with the doctrine of theology at that time, which caused conflict, but the church always moved forward. It always took that into uh, consideration. And we're at this point right now where there's really no big scientific qualms between the Catholic church and science in general. This is true. Um, I called out the Iraq war, uh, you know, on the grounds that, you know, war sucks uh, and fuck that. Uh, liberation theology. This is this, uh, I don't really understand this hugely, uh, this topic. This is where you got the, in the beef with the Nicaraguan uh, priests and he, uh, you know, he threw some shade at this Sandinista uh, associated uh, um, bishop who tried to uh, bail for him and kiss the ring and told him to sort your shit out. <laughs> uh, you know, he called out organized crime. You know, that was a big thing in Italy back then, you know, like the Pope saying, you know, stop being lunatics. Yeah, you always have these mobsters who go to church, you know. Yeah, exactly. Cloaking themselves yeah. in the, you know, in the shroud of Catholicism. You're dead right about that. <clears throat> yeah, the Rwandan genocide. But then we get on to, like, you know, he's some, uh, some, some, some big wins here. That's not, not, not deny this. You know, uh, it's not just Poland's politics he gets involved in. His visits to Chile, where he uh, roundly criticizes Pinochet's regime, are, are quite famous in South America. In Haiti, he calls out uh, Babadoc de Volier for his uh, horrendous uh, poverty, uh, but the poverty of the people uh, that he witnessed on his trip there. And just in general, you know, he, he's, he's politically active in, in his own way. You know, he's trying that line he's not like you know uh giving fire and brimstone speeches on policy or anything but uh he's calling out injustice as he sees it around the world would that be uh, a fair summation of the uh, the john paul uh political uh philosophy yes he was definitely much more of a activist than other popes had been mm -hmm. in generations past and he traveled a lot more and you know spread his message to yeah. a degree that hadn't happened before you know hundreds of uh countries uh millions of kilometers flown and driven i mean this is part due to the fact that transportation was possible while he was a priest you know in the 19th century uh, a pope visiting outside of italy was a, a logistical nightmare now you get on a plane you call ahead and it, it's doable but he really took the advantage of that now to the fact that a lot of people don't realize when you saw the pope on the news it was once every couple of months something was mentioned but now it's kind of expected that the pope should be visiting south america then africa then asia then you know back to north america the and, Pope's supposed to be on tour at all the time. And we've already covered, like, this is genuine soft power we're talking about here. And uh, in on 13th of May, 1981, the Pope is um, nearly killed. Uh, he's shot and critically wounded by a gentleman named uh, Mehmet Ali uh, Aksa. Not very gentle. An expert Turkish gunman who was a member of a fantastically named fascist group called the Grey Wolves, who uh, should uh, form a sports team, because that's a good name. Uh, so... Basically, he, he's really badly hurt here. I mean, you know, this is a Browning 9 millibar semi-automatic. Uh, he gets a shot in his abdomen, his colon is perforated, his small intestine. Uh, you know, he's rushed straight to hospital. He loses three-quarter of his blood. Mikey, you're the doctor. Like, you know, tell me how close that is to death. How does that sound? Um... Uh it's not a hyperbole to say that it was a miracle he survived. Yeah. Considering he's a pope, that maybe it was a miracle. Um, <laughs> he, clung <to> his, <laughs> he clung to his brown scapular and refused to let it go as they uh, started surgery, apparently. Uh, you know, and then he, uh, he also... Uh, <laughs> He gets stabbed with a bayonet or something. What was the other one? Uh, I'm always forgetting. I always forget the second one. It wasn't. It wasn't. He wasn't quite as badly injured in the second uh, attempt. But it's a. It's only a year later, right? And he's in Fatima, and somebody like tries to bayonet him. Old school. Uh, yeah, what is with this? He's getting shot, stabbed, hit by cars, hit by trams. I'm blaming it's, him for at least one of the it trucks. It should have been Pope Colin, no. not Pope John Paul. I'll accept bad Nazi driving for two out of the three, but one of them must have been as well. Okay, but that's a bit, bit of a sidetrack here. Yeah, but but just what I mean, like he, he, I think it's funny that he thought, it's like, oh, God, why didn't we survive? No, it sounds more like God wanted you dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There was a, a commission set up by Berlusconi in 2006, uh, the the Mitrokin Commission, which actually found that it was most likely uh, a KGB-sponsored uh, hit. Because, uh, you know, it's one of them things, it sounds too fantastic to be true, the KGB trying to whack the Pope, like, you know, why would they try? But when you when you see the, the evidence that they turned up, that they were, you know, safe enough using kind of Bulgarian operatives that were well removed in the satellite states, and you kind of think... Well, he did cause them a lot of trouble. 
Mike, any credence to this, would you say? I, I, I think it's possible, especially since we have to remember that when we're talking about the Eastern, uh, the communist bloc nations, it's not like they were single minded. There were different groups and different parties that had different agendas. And there definitely might have been some services there that decided, you know what, it would be a good idea if this guy went away. So they talked to somebody who talked to somebody and a chain of events began, which, which could have left to check this out, right? This assassination attempt. During his papacy, there were many, much more than usual clerics within the Vatican who, upon nomination, declined to be ordained and then mysteriously left the church. What was up with that? Mm. Maybe they knew the KG Bizzle. That's what was up with it. Hizzle, shizzle in the Vatican. I won't won't talk like Snoop Dogg anymore. I promise all our listeners that'll never happen again. (laughs) The 90s wants its jokes back, Dave, and I appreciate the 90s as much as any man. So, yeah, that's a. um, Those assassination attempts, again, they really kind of. um, They lift the mythology of him as a man. You You have to put that in context. I mean, you know, he's the first guy to kind of travel around the world and take on regimes and kind of be, you know, be a bit more political and get shot for his trouble. It's also actually <clears throat> worth kind of pointing out that the time that that, that that first assassination attempt, what, 1981, kind of, uh, it wasn't that long after a successful assassination attempt on John Lennon, and then not long after that, there was an unsuccessful assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. So... They were very shooting the early days. They, they? It, 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 there was a time, you know, and I, because I can recall, you know, it was on the news, it would be, you know, you know, two or three months would go by and then and then somebody else kind of of major world importance. Uh, okay, maybe John Lennon, not so much. But, uh, but you know. He also, public, uh, yeah. he also wasn't above an apology. Uh, you know, Galileo got an apology uh, while he was in power. I, was, I think every skill boy who's ever studied history you know, is happy on Galileo's behalf that he got that apology finally. Uh, Catholic involvement with the slave trade, yeah. Um, burnings at the stake, yeah. No, that wasn't good, was it? Um, injustices against women and violation of women's rights. And Josh, um, he apologised for inactivity and silence of many Catholics during the Holocaust. Uh, now, he also apologised, and I don't think a lot of people realise this, that he did apologise for actually the Catholic sex abuse cases as well. Now, that is a controversial topic. Um, do you think it's fair, Michael, uh, you know, some of the dirt that's been thrown his way since he died uh, when he isn't able to defend himself about cover-ups, the Ratzinger kind of chain of command, was Ratzinger his bag man to kind of move these priests around and keep them out of trouble? Or, you know, is it is it is it just is it just... Something that goes on and, you know, while we can't, if you can't directly accuse it of himself, is it a bit unfair to, you know, tar him with the brush? Plus, I'm uh, of the mind that these scandals that keep coming up right now are part of them. uh, Some of them are true, but some of them are being used as well to uh, to fight the institution of uh, Christianity in general. And, you know, it's a touchy subject. Uh, the things that were going on then and now and that will go on in the future are just, you know, part of human nature, unfortunately. When you have closed institutions, even if it's a church, there will be bad people among there that use their position. I would say that in Ireland, formerly the most religious country uh, in Europe, you know, or one of them up there, maybe second place behind the polls back in the day. You know, they lost the people over the like the Ryan report and the, the sex abuse scandal. Like, and there's a certain generation that just just totally gave up on the Catholic Church because they just all knew too many people that had happened and to. I, I think that's and, a tr- you know, true shame, and that's horrible. It really is. It really is. It destroyed their position in society uh, in Ireland. Uh, uh, alongside, I actually, <clears throat> I actually think I, I haven't really seen this view kind of widely disseminated, but I actually think that. The type of person that John Paul II was, who had, he was kind of, he, he had this very kind of full life that was, since kind of age 20, was pretty much devoted to the church. He was obviously very well fitted to the type of lifestyle that, uh, that, that being a Catholic priest demand. He, although he was physically active, he kind of very, I think he wholeheartedly embraced the whole idea of celibacy and seriousness of it. I think that he actually struggled to even comprehend or believe that people inside the church could even be behaving like that. It's, yeah, I, I realise mm. that that's kind of, you know, this is going out well, I see in, where very going much... I think the question lived. has always been, how much did he know? Uh, and I think it's a fair question, and I think there are some, some worrying signs that he might have known. I known. suspect he was told a lot, but what I, my contention is, as I yeah, say, to it's him, controversial. It's, it's so well it's like, Yeah, no, I get what like, you're saying, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 kind of, you know, these, uh, you know, I don't want to hear, you know, the ears are not listening kind of thing. 
Yes, you know. and also it's a bit much to expect one man to as much as a thing. Like I don't see as much as he's a reformer. I don't see Francis, uh, you know, rooting branching out, uh, you know, priests left, right, and center, and uh, stripping them of their <laughs> of their frock. It's always going to be a, a touchy kind of delicate topic. I think um, you know as well. It's also a, a much more naughty debate. It sounds like oh, he missed the boat on contraception in Africa and AIDS. He gets you know he gets this blame for for the uh, AIDS virus uh, rampage in true Africa. I think it's completely misplaced blame as and, well. But and look, you have to look at it from the point of view. You know, this guy took canon law seriously. It was something he studied his whole life, theology. And if you're going to dedicate your life to a religion. It has a set of rules, and changing those rules will always be controversial, etc. And why should we have expected to him to have the kind of viewpoints that we now accept as kind of mainstream in terms of uh, you know you know those issues? We also have to remember that the Catholic Church works, you know, in a different type of like scale of time. Uh, something is trendy in our society right now. Last 10, 20, 30, 50 years, the Catholic Church is talk, thinking two thousand years. They're gonna, they're not gonna reform or change a, a tradition or a belief just because that's the in thing right now for a generation or two. So when they do change, it's something that is substantial, a social change, and not something that. No, it's been popular since the 60s, so it's going to be the way it's going to always be, and we'll, we're going to uh, flip over to that. Or uh, Also, we, we've been using his name wrong all along, because he's actually uh, a saint now, so should, shouldn't it be like St. John Paul II? It's not the official term, no. no oh, oh, sorry, what is the official term? I don't honestly know, but it's the Saint, uh, I love saint the way John Paul II. It's not really, it's just, I think it's... Uh, Actually, I think it's like St. Cuddlevoy too, but I'm not 100% sure of that right now. I love now. the way you become a maid guy, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, you got to have, you gotta have two miracles, you know, both of him or after his death, you know. Well, uh, the miracles only count because it's, you have to be pray to this person uh, once they're dead to see if, you know, he will like step in and ask God, hey, I got this guy down there. He's asking for this. Could you maybe uh, do something? Well, he lobbed his first uh, miracle thunderbolt down from heaven on uh, June uh, 2005, a French nun with Parkinson's disease was miraculously cured apparently um, supposedly uh, while he performed his second on a Costa Rican woman with an aneurysm of course uh, six years after his death well why not beatified in 2011 uh, yes uh, I'm calling him St. John Paul why not I mean what, I thought you call someone well, who's yeah, beatified according saint- to Wikipedia which is you know obviously nearly always right about just about everything uh, the correct form is Pope St. John Paul II there you go. Now, I read something very interesting, because the, the thing in Krakow is, you always hear, is that he was a Krakowia fan, right? But there's an interesting line at the end of that Wikipedia entry. I don't know who, who put it in there. Probably a Liverpool fan messing around. But it says... <laughs> <laughs> it, it says that having played the game himself as a goalkeeper, John Paul II was a fan of English football team, Liverpool. Well, his compatriot, uh, Jerzy Dudek, plays in the same position at the time, which is interesting, because uh, if he had have lived uh, just a month and a half longer, he would have got to see... Uh, the, the miracle in Istanbul. The miracle of Istanbul. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, a yeah, real yeah. miracle, you know. St. Stevie should have been beatified on the spot, I'll tell you that much. Uh, you know, and the other um, thing I want to mention is that the airport's named after him, and I think we've covered on on previous episodes, I think he got a bit screwed over there, because everyone calls that airport Bad Eats, and he can't rename an existing Thing, airport that already has an established name, if you know what I mean. Yeah, but the thing is, most airports are usually known by like the region or the part of the city they're in, and not the actual. Uh, like I think, like Okencha as well in Warsaw, it's Chopina. Yeah, and nobody remembers it. It's just Okencha as well. I think Pisovica and uh, Katowice is also named somebody. <laughs> well, yeah, that one's a little more understandable, I suppose. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, and uh, I think that's uh, pretty much probably all the time we have uh, for it this evening. The only other thing I had written down in my notes is that apparently, <laughs> I love this, he addressed uh, MEPs uh, in 1988 in chamber. And <laughs> Ian Paisley stood up and said, I denounce you as an antichrist! <laughs> and had to be dragged from the chamber uh, by the crown prince of Austria-Hungary and a few of his cronies. So, Sounds uh, like something you would talk about that in is, a bar. That, that is an amazing collision of so many different strands of European history just right there, isn't uh, it? You know, like a Protestant, an Ulsterman, a crown prince from Austria, and a, and a Polish Roman Catholic pope, yeah. 
Fantastic. Yeah, and I think yeah, I think we can all agree that uh, whatever your thoughts on the man, uh, whatever your thoughts on the institution and how he ran it, uh, he certainly lived a fascinating full life and uh, thoroughly inspired uh, millions of his uh, countrymen and people all around the world, uh, and not just for religious reasons. Uh, Mike, would you like any closing thoughts on uh, Pope John Paul II, Pope Saint John Paul II? Uh, now you put me on the spot. I feel like I should say something touching and pronounced. Yeah, something profound. Yeah. Uh, something really deep. And shit. Uh, well, uh, he was a good pop. All right, come on. All right, he was a great uncle. Yeah. 